What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Here we are with another reaction video and in this one we have India taught me the real meaning of spirituality. I can't wait to jump at this. I hope I said the name right. Cute Blackson or Coop Blackson, however you say it. Uh, if you guys happen to enjoy this video, please don't forget to hit that uh, subscribe button, get a video a like. And if you'd like to support this channel by becoming a member, all you got to do is hit that join button to receive your exclusive benefits. And let's dive right in. When I was in India, I spent a lot of time with amazing enlightened beings. Um, I wanted to meet an enlightened master. And this was a, a guy called Gangoli. And I found him in the middle of Carolina mountains. And he was a profound man. And I got to sit with him and ask him and talk to him. And he just shared about life shit about existence. But what I will say is there were many people that I met on the journey in India that actually touched me even more because I was looking for enlightenment in this mystical, uh, higher, you know, enlightened guru with a beard, you know. I had this sort of preconceived idea of mm. what the form of wisdom mm. was going to come in, in this package of. And as amazing as this enlightened teacher was, this enlightened teacher was, this enlightened teacher was, I, I wanna share a story of a guy I met. I'm so excited. After about three months of traveling throughout India, meeting all these enlightened people, I was exhausted. <laughs> I just wanna say, I love the fact that he talks about like, I guess in our heads, a lot of the times we assume where wisdom is going to come from or we assume what a person is going to look like or you know what I'm saying? So when he's talking about, I assume when I went to India, I'd meet some enlightened gurus and they would be in the form of maybe like an older person with a beard. And this would be this guru that spread so much wisdom to me about life and everything. But he's like, he met these enlightened gurus and after three months felt exhausted but I can't wait to hear the story about the man that I'm sure he was actually enlightened by how this guy looked and the wisdom that he was given by this man. That's so cool. I mean, they all give me this profound wisdom, nature of consciousness, nature of life. We yeah. are souls. We are this. We, I mean, all of it's true. It was profound. Mm -hmm. I was in Bodh Gaya where the Buddha got enlightened by the Bodhi tree. It was 120 degrees. And there was this one day where I was exhausted and I sat down and I'm like, in the pursuit of happiness, I was suffering even more mm. because I was just constantly seeking something. And I sat down outside of the temple and I'll never forget the day where I saw these 10 beggars. Mm. And every day I would see these 10 beggars. But this particular day, maybe as my exhaustion, I saw this one guy sitting down on the floor. And he was singing, like singing. I have no idea what he was singing, but singing praises to the divine with a little drum, singing, singing, singing. Everyone else is begging. And I look at this guy and I've seen him every day, but I didn't notice him because he was not enlightened, at least in my perception. Mm. He was not some great guru, right? Yeah. Big ashram big following, so why am I gonna listen to this guy? But I sat there and I just observed him singing this day. And I'm like, wow, this dude is singing like with his whole heart, his whole beingness, his whole essence, like putting all of him. And it was like the energy field around him was projecting out and he was so free in a way that was so surprising because I did not expect this guy to be this free. Yeah. So I observed him for another 20, 30 minutes and I started to cry. Oh, wow. Because as I saw him singing, there was such a purity in his heart in the way he was singing. He wow. didn't care. He didn't care about anything. Whether anyone was there, whether anyone was giving him money, he was just freaking singing. <laughs> And so I realized that. Uh, to me, that like, it sounds so beautiful because 
that's one thing I feel like that I really want to be able to do is like not care about a lot of things, not care what others think about me. Um, that's probably the biggest thing uh, is to be able to not care what others perceive about me. But you got this guy uh, that he just probably was there every day with the beggars that he just passed by because why he wasn't this enlightened guru with the big following. So it was like, why? Why should I listen to him, take advice from him, notice him? Like, I, I just care about seeking wisdom. I care about, you know what I'm saying? A higher purpose, seeking my reason for being here, seeking so much. But what can this guy offer me? He just, but then he takes the time to actually just exhaust it because he's always seeking, he's always searching for something and he continues to meet enlightened guru after enlightened guru and although they're giving him very profound wisdom and advice he's still seeking something he still hasn't found exactly what he's looking for so he's exhausted and on this day the peak of his exhaustion i assume he just takes the time and watches this guy singing singing with everything that he had his entire essence his entire being just singing without a care in the world with didn't didn't matter if there were a hundred thousand people surrounding him or zero he was going to sing the same whether you put money or you gave him money or not he was going to sing the same and that really touched him okay let's continue because i'm locked into the story he was just freaking singing and so I realized that this man was not a beggar. In fact, I looked at him and I realized, I think I'm more of a beggar than he is. And so I went up to him. He couldn't speak English, so I got a translator. And I went up to this, this man and I realized he was blind. So he couldn't wow. see. He couldn't see if anybody was watching. Mm. He couldn't see if anyone was appreciating. He couldn't see if anybody was, was there. And I thought of myself and all the things I used to do for fame, all the things I used to do so that people would notice and appreciate me. And like, this guy couldn't see one person, a hundred people. And then I looked at him and I saw that he had no arms. Oh, wow. Straight up, no arms. And here he was singing and he was beating these drums. Well, what? With his feet? With his hands. <laughs> Like, like stumps. Oh, stuck, yeah. these stumps. Oh, okay, gotcha. Sorry, drums, I just had to clarify. Right? And he was just beating these drums and just ecstatic. Truly ecstatic. This is what got me. I'm like, wow. I have no idea what he's saying, but I could feel him. And he's no eyes, no hands, couldn't even eat or by no himself. Arms. Wow. No legs. You know, no. Legs are mangled. That's why he was the only beggar sitting down. No eyes, no hands, no legs. And he is singing, giving praises to his creator freely. And I realized he'd been doing this all day, every day for the last two weeks I'd been there. I just didn't notice because he didn't come hey. in this enlightened package I had imagined. Yeah. And I sat there with tears in my eyes with a translator, I'm like crying. Right? And, and, and I said to him, how do you manage to sit here every day? You don't know if anyone is looking, appreciating, clapping. You don't know if, you don't even know how much money you're making. Mm. I have every reason to be happy and you have every reason to not be happy. Mm. And here you are free, happy, ecstatic. Yes. I felt like the beggar. And so I told him this and it was as though he looked at me, couldn't see me, but it's like he looked straight through my soul. And here I am expecting, I'm like got my journal out ready to take some notes from this guy. <laughs> and through the translator, I said, how do you manage to do this every day? You give your heart, give your love, you know? For me, my, my friend doesn't call me back. I'm pissed off, <laughs> I'm yeah. mad, right? They don't text me, I'm upset. And you just keep singing. And he said, what else is there to do? I'm like, what? What else is there to That's do? crazy. Then he kept playing. Then he turned. That's literally crazy. Like, 
Because here I am, like, the build up the entire time. I'm expecting, like, some very, very profound thing. Something, like, that just absolutely blows my mind. But his answer, when asked, why do you keep doing this? Or how do you keep doing this every day? Continue playing you, who has every reason to be sad. Me, who has every reason to be happy. Yet, you're ecstatic all the time beating these drums, singing to your heart's content, yet me who gets angry if a friend doesn't call me back. How do you manage this? And his answer is, what else is there to do, right? And I love that answer because it's like, he could he could be complaining. He could say, woe is me. I've been dealt the, the crappiest hand in life, I've, right? He has every reason to be upset. We would think, at least we would think, he has every reason to be upset, angry, hurt. But here he is, happy, free, ecstatic, praising his creator day and night, every day. And his answer to how he manages to do that is, what else is there to do? And I love that answer so freaking much. Because that answer applies to everything that we do in life, right? What else is there to do? Why do you work so hard? What else is there to do? This is awesome. All right, talk to me. Finish. What else Keep is there going. to do? Then he kept playing. Then he turned back to me, looked into my soul. And he said, look, sometimes life will give you what you want. Sometimes life will not give you what you want, but you can always give life who you are. Mm. And he just kept freaking singing, man. Life will give you what you want. And it was like something hit me in that transmission, the simplicity, <laughs> no esoteric chakra. It was just the pure simplicity of a man who was living his spirituality, living it. No philosophy, no theory, just demonstrating love every day through his form and I saw all the ways that I wasn't waiting mm. for some special moment in my life waiting for some special break waiting to meet Oprah waiting for an <laughs> audience waiting for something yeah and I saw that I was suffering mm. and so that really impacted my life in such a way because I started to see and experience that real spirituality is not in a temple or in the words I say or in my ability to open my pineal gland or in my yoga posture or in my lotus position. But that real spirituality is just how I live my life. It's who I am with you each moment. It's how I show up. It's how the degree to which I just dare to be love moment to moment to moment and love everything and everyone to the best of my capacity as the divine in each moment. And so for me, it's simple moments like that that really impacted me, you know? It's like I was staying at a, a mentor of mine's ashram in India at the time, a man called Dwakoji. He's quite well known. Oh, his answer was, sometimes life will give you what you want. Sometimes life won't. But you can always give who you are. And his, the thing about it, I guess that for him was the simplicity in that. And I 100% agree with that. And then I really loved, he said he was living it. It wasn't this, this thing, this ideal. It, it, it was him living. It wasn't him preaching it. It was seeing him living out his spirituality every single day, showing love, giving praise, uh, and just giving all of himself every single day. And I can understand why he saw such a beauty in that, because there is a beauty in that. Um, I feel like we would all aspire to do that, give every bit of ourselves each day and be as happy as could be, be as carefree and ecstatic as could be. So it's like, we could all learn a lesson from that, man. I know I definitely could learn a lesson from him. Uh, and just being able to give myself. Give, give, you know what I'm saying? 
no matter what life deals you, no matter if life gives me what I want or not, I can always give who I am. Come on now. But he passed away at a hundred and something. I met him when he was 80. Wow. This is a man who serves the underprivileged kids. This is why I went to Bodh Gaya in the first place to meet with him. And I, I had these, I'll confess, I had these mm -hmm. visions of, be, of like, I'm going to be like Mother Teresa. You know, it's going to be like this romantic thing. And so he builds schools for the underprivileged kids. And so he has an ashram, an ashram as in an orphanage, where there's like 300 underprivileged kids. So I went there to serve them. And these are kids that he finds in the trash, uh, just living in the trash. They have no parents. They come, they live with him, and he serves them. And this is what he's been doing up until that point for 80 years. So I got to be with him and serve the kids. After two weeks, I was exhausted. This is what led <laughs> me to roam the streets and meet this scene. <laughs> and Duakoji was a beautiful man. And I said to him after two weeks, hey, Duakoji, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, man. Like, these kids are crazy. They don't appreciate me that I'm trying. Like, they're not socialized. I'm, I'm tired. I'm gonna go to the temple and I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna meditate by the Bodhi tree. And these two sort of two experiences came together for me because they happened a few days apart. And this 80 year old man full of wisdom, he looked at me and he said, it's beautiful that you go to the Bodhi tree and pray and meditate. But just make sure that whilst you're meditating, your heart doesn't turn to stone. Mm. Because right here in this very simple ashram, it's an orphanage, are 300 living Buddhas, Ooh. living Christs, waiting for you to serve them. Dang. Yeah. And so yeah. it's moments like that that really changed my life to realize that real spiritu spirituality, you know, is, is loving. Real spirituality mm. is the degree to which we love and serve mm. and serve others as myself. And for me, that's, that's to, to embody it, you know, is yeah. love is the embodiment of spirituality and for me there is no real spirituality without love in action i found that uh extremely like beautiful like the way he put that um and i love that he went over there to india and got this uh wisdom passed upon him and he's like he's exhausted after to this man had done this for 80 years have been serving these kids um, finding them in the worst of the worst conditions. He had been there two weeks serving them. And he was exhausted. He said, these kids don't appreciate me. They, they don't care what I do. They, I'm exhausted. I'm going to go to the Buddha tree and pray. He's like, that's beautiful that you go there to meditate and pray. But just remember, here in this simple ashram, this orphanage, there are 300 living Buddhas. There are 300 living Christ for you to serve. That is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, I, I love it because, I mean, you think of the Bible and you think of uh, love others as you would love thyself and do others as you would do unto yourself. And I think we just, we all hear that and we love the sound of it. But I think very few of us actually live it. We actually live that where we, very few of us are actually willing to go out there and serve others like we would serve ourselves. Our, very few of us are willing to love others like we would love ourselves. And I think that's, that's just not right, right? I think what he said in the end, spirituality is just about loving and action. And so while all these spiritual things sound incredible from, from gurus or from books or from wherever you, you're getting this wisdom. It sounds incredible. If you're not actually living it, then it's like, what's the point? What's going on? Like, yeah, read. Yeah, pray. Yeah, meditate. But also live out your spirituality. That was awesome. That's all we have. If you guys enjoy it, Please don't forget to subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and check out the next one. I'll see you guys next time.